Today's passage is found in Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 11. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if, in fact, the spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Amen. Amen. Uh, Are there any psych majors in the room today? Or perhaps in your college experience, you took some basic level psych? Uh, There's a term in psychology uh, that you guys are probably familiar with called cognitive, cognitive dissonance. Cognitive dissonance. It's the discomfort someone feels when their behavior does not align with their values or beliefs. And this is the tension that everyone goes through, and particularly for the Christian as well. This is the tension that Paul actually describes in the previous chapter, in Romans chapter 7. He says this in verse 15, where he says, For I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want but I do the very thing that I hate. Doesn't that sum up our daily lives, kind of? I don't do the things that I should do, and I do the things that I really ought not to do. This is the cognitive dissonance that comes upon the Christian. There are things that I know that are good for me, that God wants, that pleases him, but I'm not able to do it. And although there's things that God that displeases God, there's sin that I should not do, but I can't help but participate in it. And we're left with this discomfort, with this tension in our minds and our hearts. It's the new year. Some of us might have made resolutions to start new good habits. Some of us are here maybe trying to stop old bad ones. Don't raise your hands, but think, if, if, have you ever heard the un, <laughs> unhelpful advice of when you're trying to start a new habit, just, or when you're trying to stop a new habit, just stop. Just don't do it. Have you been given that advice in your life? Or when you're trying to start a new good habit, maybe like exercising, as Nike would say, just do it. Has this advice ever been given to you? Have you noticed that this advice actually, you know, is not very helpful? Have you ever actually been able to change yourself with just, yeah, just pull up the bootstraps and do it, or just stop? No, well, you notice if you've long, lived long enough, if you've tried long, hard enough, that it simply does not work. And so Peter, I mean, Apostle Paul, after describing this tension of not doing the things he ought and doing the things he ought not, he writes chapter 8. And instead of just telling the Christian, hey, just stop doing those things, or hey, just start doing it, rather than that, he gives us promises of being in Christ. He gives us a picture of what life looks like in the spirit. And he gives us these beautiful truths to encourage us and strengthen us with assurance as we deal with the sin, as we deal with this dissonance in our lives. And as we begin in these first 11 verses, we're going to walk through the passage of looking, while looking at the new status that we have in the spirit, the new purpose we have, and the new walk. The new status, the new purpose, and the new walk. So let's begin with the new status. Uh, Many of you know that I grew up moving back and forth pretty frequently between Korea and the U.S. And it was around eighth grade uh, when I came out to Korea again. And this time I'm a little bit older and a little bit more aware of the world. 
And as we came out to Korea, I, I noticed on our way over, I noticed my father had a different colored passport. He didn't have your typical blue colored US passport, but if I'm not mistaken, I think it was red. And so I asked him, wait, well, what is that? Why is your passport different? And he got, went to explain to me that this was a diplomatic passport. My father works for the government, and so he had a diplomatic passport and diplomatic privileges. And as he was explaining this to me and all the different kind of perks and things that came along with it, he talked about diplomatic immunity. Diplomatic immunity. Have you guys heard of this term before? And for a young teenager, this was the coolest idea ever. <laughs> diplomatic immunity basically is you have legal immunity from the jurisdiction of that country you are going to. Basically, and, and my father, he couldn't, the Korean country, the government, would have no jurisdiction over him because he had diplomatic immunity. And so I asked him, well, does that extend to me? <laughs> <laughs> and he told me it does as a dependent. And as a teenager, that was super cool. <laughs> Not that I had plans to commit any crimes, but, you know, a teenager, that it seems like a superpower. Um, you know, I was going to Seoul Foreign School at the time, and so after school, we would go to Shincheon or Hongdae, and hypothetically, hypothetically, if my group of friends and I were to get into some trouble, they would all be in trouble with the Korean government. But me, I had immunity. I was special. I was special. That immunity, I, Korea had no hold on me. This, I, so I'm oversimplifying diplomatic immunity. The, the laws are way more nuanced than this, but I'm doing this to illustrate a point. That in Christ, we have immunity, complete immunity from the law. Look at me with, with me again at verse 1. He says, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. No condemnation. The definition of condemnation, it's, it's a legal ter term for both the sentence and the execution of the sentence. To be tried and then punished. A charge is held against you, and therefore a debt is now owed. And today, if your faith is resting in Jesus Christ, there is no condemnation for you. You have been set free from the law of sin and death. You cannot be tried. You cannot be punished for your sins anymore. We all have immunity. How? It was through the blood of Christ. Christ paid the debt of all our sins in full, and there's nothing left to be paid for, nothing left to be paid for. If you went out to dinner this week to your favorite restaurant, and you ran up the bill, and I came and I paid that tab, would it make any sense for you to then take that bill, go to the counter and say, hey, I'm going to pay this? Would it make any sense for the restaurant to come to you and say, you have a debt to us? Absolutely not. That tab is paid in full. No payment is required. And that means for all your sins, past, present, future, the sins that you're aware of, the sins that you're unaware of, the sins that you intentionally do, the, ten, the sins that you unintentionally do, all of it is paid for in Jesus Christ. There's no more debt. There's no more charge. There's no condemnation. Now, I want us to notice this phrase here that Paul says, there is therefore now no condemnation. We look at this, right, no condemnation. In English, this no is actually really, really weak. It doesn't signify the emphasis that Paul is trying to make. When you look at the Greek, Paul actually starts this verse saying no, 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 no more condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. He's emphasizing this. For the believer, though you struggle with sin, you are no longer condemned. It's impossible for the Christian. There's no going back and forth between condemnation. It's not like, okay, I'm struggling with this sin. I've done it for the 99th time, but the 100th time, I think God's patience is going to run out, and then I'm going to have to owe something. No, no condemnation. We might think to ourselves, you know, as long as I keep myself in the boundaries of those kind of safe, you know, sins where, you know, those harmless sins, right, that we think of, right, lying, maybe anger, gossiping. As long as I'm staying within that boundaries, I'm good. There's no condemnation. 
But as, as soon as I step over that line and, and I go into the big leagues and perhaps, you know, I commit an affair or I, I'm stealing, God forbid, I, I'm j- driving drunk and I hit someone, I actually kill someone. Whatever the lines you draw of this is acceptable and this is not, there are no lines. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. I want us to take a moment to look at the Old Testament and the New Testament characters that are given to us in the Bible. A lot of the times we put these men and women up on a pedestal and we see them as great examples of faith. And there is a lot that we can learn from them. But if you notice, the Bible is careful to point out the flaws and the shortcomings and the sins of these men and women. Why does it do that? Well, first, it wants to show us just how dark Let's start with Abraham, the great father of the faith, right? He stepped out in faith, he left his homeland, and he trusted God and followed him. But did you know Abraham was a coward? He gave his wife away to another man saying that it was his sister in order to save his own hide, to protect himself. Not just once, but twice. Let's look at Noah, faithful, obedient Noah. When the world was mocking him for making this ark, he stayed faithful, he stayed the course, and he made the ark. And even after witnessing God save him and preserve his family from that flood, after that experience, Noah, what does he do? He gives into his desires, gets wasted drunk, and lies shamefully in his tent naked. But there is no condemnation. Let's move on to David. King David. The one who the Bible describes as a man after God's own heart. That's high praise. But what is David known for? Out of his lust and the corruption of his heart, he sleeps with another man's wife and then proceeds to have that husband killed. But for David, there was no condemnation. Peter, one of Jesus' own disciples who walked with Jesus, who ate with Jesus, slept with him, listened to him, witnessed the power of God being manifested through him. And yet despite all of this, at the end of Jesus' life, when he's being mocked, cursed, spit upon, wrongfully accused, whipped, stumped, beaten, Peter denies Jesus not once, not twice, but three times. But yet there was no condemnation. I don't know what lines you draw in your own mind of this is okay, God can forgive this, but this, no, I got to pay. There are no lines for those who are in Christ Jesus. There is no condemnation. I want us to really grasp this truth and hold on to it, not let go. Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones said that most of our troubles are due to our failure to realize the truth of this verse. Most of our troubles come from not fully understanding the way of no condemnation. So what type of troubles does it bring? Why is it so important? What does it mean for us practically? When we usually sin, there are two things that kind of work against us to drive us away from Christ and doubt his promises. Satan and our own conscience, our own guilty conscience. Satan comes in and starts accusing you and says, "Uh, you think God can love you now? You think God accepts you? You think he forgives you? And even our own consciences speak the same way to our minds. As you've been listening to this sermon so far, there's probably a particular sin that's popped into your mind that you are struggling with right now. Lust, envy, anger, whatever it may be. As you clash with this sin in your life, what are some of the feelings and the thoughts that come into your mind as you stumble with this sin? You think to yourself, how could God possibly love me? 
he loves me, yeah, but he probably loves me a little bit less. So you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try harder. I'm going to become that A-plus student and really, you know, shine so that I can earn his love. You might ask yourself, how could God possibly forgive me? I've been struggling so long with this sin. It has had a grip on my life, and I've fallen over and over and over again. Surely, God does not forgive me. So I need to show him I'm serious this time. Uh, I'm going to get up in the morning. I'm going to do my QTs. I'm going to pray at least an hour a day. I'm going to do all these things to show that I am worthy of being forgiven. Or we might think this as, how could God accept me after this sin? I, I can't pray. I can't go to church. Maybe, maybe after I've repented long enough and I meant it and, and I do some good to kind of balance the scales, then I can go back to God. And then he will accept me. These are all lies from the devil. These are all lies that arise from the unhealthy, guilty conscience. And they are all anti-gospel. They all come from not knowing that there is therefore no condemnation in Christ Jesus. That you are fully loved, accepted, and forgiven. And when these lies come in, what's the result? They either, they, they separate us. They, they put a wedge in our relationship with God. We feel like we cannot go to him anymore. And it shakes our confidence and the assurance that we should have in his promises. We begin to doubt his love for us. We begin to doubt what Christ accomplished for us on that cross. They drive us to legalism, to try to work harder, to earn it from God. It also drives us to obey God out of guilt and fear and duty, which actually has no power to change us. All of these are ultimately lives that drive us away from Christ and resting in his promises. So how do we respond to these lies? Uh, we sing a song before the throne of God here at Gospel City. And one of these verses just so beautifully illustrates what the Christian is to do when this comes. It says this, when Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within, upward I look and see him there who made an end to all my sin. Because the sinless Savior died, my sinful soul is counted free. For God the just is justified to look on him and pardon me. What is that sin that is driving a wedge between you and God? What is that sin weighing you down, bringing in these lies, stealing away from the, the security of the gospel? When that comes in, hold on to his promises. Lift up your eyes and look to the cross. Look upward and not inward. Run to him. Trust in him. Because life in the spirit means you have been given a new status. There is no more condemnation for you. No more condemnation. Now, as an immature teen teenager, I heard this idea of immunity. And I thought to myself, whoa, that gives me license to do absolutely whatever I want to do without any consequences. And well, that is not certainly not the case for the Christian. We aren't given immunity to do whatever we want, to do whatever sin we please without consequence. We're not only given a new status, but we're also given a new purpose, a new purpose. Paul inextricably links the idea in verse 1 and verse 2 that if you are in Christ, yes, there is therefore now no condemnation, but now you will also grow in holiness. That is your new purpose. In the spirit, you are given a purpose to grow more and more in the image of Christ. In John chapter 8, there's a story of a woman caught in adultery. I'm sure many of us are familiar with it. And the story goes, uh, the woman was found in the act of adultery. And so the Pharisees and scribes brought this woman before Jesus. And they asked Jesus, what are we to do with her? Because the Mosaic law says that she should be stoned. So Jesus, what do you propose we do with this woman? They were trying to trap Jesus with this question. And the irony of the situation is they weren't really concerned about the woman at all. They weren't concerned about the law at all. They were just after Jesus. They were trying to trap him. Because if Jesus said not to stone this woman, in essence, he would be going against the Mosaic law, 
and he'd be discrediting himself among many Jews and his followers. And he, they might accuse Jesus of prom uh, promoting licentiousness. If Jesus had said yes, that we should go and stone this woman for breaking the law, they could now bring a charge against Jesus because during that time, only the Romans had the authority and power to put someone to death. But by Jesus confirming that yes, we should stone her, he would then be subject to Roman law. The scribes and the Pharisees could then turn him in. But Jesus, in his wisdom and his mercy, responds like this. Let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. Mic drop. No one could say anything. One by one, the crowd left. The Pharisee left. The scribes left. And it was just Jesus and this woman standing there. And Jesus says to her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? And, Jesus said, no, and she said, no one, Lord. And hear this. Jesus said this to her. Neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, sin no more. Neither do I condemn you, and from now on, sin no more. I don't condemn you. Now go be holy. This one phrase from Jesus summarizes these first four verses in Romans chapter 8. Look down with me, and let me read verses 1 to 4 for us. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin... He condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the spirit, according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. What Paul is saying in these verses is that we were once under an old system. We were given the law. And once given the law, we were required to follow it. And if we followed it well enough, if we followed it perfectly, then we could be found righteous before God and we can have acceptance by God. But the problem is the law was given and the law had absolutely no power to change our hearts to follow that law. The law was weakened by the flesh, as Paul said. The law has no power to make us righteous. It has no power to make us obedient. Think about it. There's a, there's a commandment, right? Thou shalt not covet. The law is given to us. We know it. We hear it. It says, yes, Lord, great. I know. I should not covet. But that law in itself, will it change your heart as you go home and maybe hop on an Instagram and you see people living that, that glorious life, that good life? Will, you, will your heart not covet just based simply on having been given this law? No. This law has no power to change you. And so God has done what the law could not do. He sent his son to die for us, to live the life that we could not live and die the death we could not die and to bring us under a new system, to bring us under where the spirit, where we are now then given the ability and the desire to follow God's law. Before, the law had no power, but now in the spirit, we have the power to follow God. God and his law. This is God's work prophesied in the book of Ezekiel in the Old Testament. In chapter 36, 26 to 27, it says, I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. The law was unable to change our hearts. So God sent his son. And we have to realize that we have a new purpose now that Christ came and lived and died and resurrected for us. It's to grow in holiness with the power of the Holy Spirit. We can't miss what Paul's saying here. There's two sides of the salvation coin. Yes, Christ came to pay for our sins, to give us salvation, to bring us acceptance before God. And on the other side of that coin, Christ also lived and died and resurrected so that you could live a holy life, that you can now grow more and more into his image. 
God accepts us as we are, but he does not leave us where we are. He enters our lives and begins to work in us and make us more into his son's image. John Stott said it like this, God condemns sin in Christ so that the holiness might appear in us. God saves us from the condemnation of sin, and he saves us from the power of sin so that we can overcome it in this life. If there is no condemnation for you, that means you have also a new status, that the purpose of your life is to grow in holiness. And as we seek to live out this new purpose, we need to understand the proper motive for living out this purpose. We have to have the proper moment. If we take a look at these passages that we just covered, there is a specific order of things that were said, things that happened. In the story of the adulterous woman, Jesus said first, I don't condemn you. And then he says, go sin no more. In Ezekiel, he says, I will give you a new heart. I will put my spirit in you. I will give you a heart of flesh. And then he says, I will make you walk in my statutes and obey my rules. And today in Romans, it says, God sent his son first to do what the law could not do. And then in order for us to be able to live out the righteous requirement of the law. It's the gospel that comes first and serves as our motive, as our engine, as our drive to live a holy life. Paul says that Jesus came in the likeness of sinful flesh and lived perfectly, obediently to God, a righteous life that we cannot live. And then he gave his life as a sin offering for our failure to live that righteous life. And now we have been set free and we have been given the spirit who lives in us, who gives us the power to follow God's law. Sometimes we live in our understanding of God, of Christ's work, just as salvation, but extends to our sanctification as well, to our growth. But we've got to be careful not to put the cart before the horse. It's the gospel. We look to the gospel, and we see the gospel will generate an awe and gratitude in our hearts that gives us the proper motivation to live for him. Not fear, not guilt, not shame, not duty, but gratitude and love for what has been done for us. The gospel isn't stop sinning, be holy. The gospel is look, behold, receive, trust, rest in the grace and love that I've shown you in Jesus Christ. And let that motivate your heart to stop sinning. Jesus didn't go to the, to the woman and say, hey, stop sinning, and then I'm not going to condemn you. No, whatever was going on in her life that caused her to fall into that sin and to participate in that activity, the law simply, thou shalt not commit adultery, had no power to change her. She probably knew it very well. She probably learned it growing up in Jewish culture, but had absolutely no power to change it. But what did have the power to change it? I don't condemn you. You're loved. You're forgiven. I accept you fully. Now I'll go sin no more. The gospel gives us the motive to live out our purpose. And in the spirit, we have a new purpose. We have a new walk. Uh, we have a new purpose, and now we have a new walk. The result of Christ's work and the spirit living in us is now that we have a new walk. Look down with me in reverse four again. In order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fill, fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Who walk not according to the flesh, but walk according to the spirit. We have to notice here that this statement is not conditional. If you are in Christ, if you have been born again, you will walk according to the spirit, is what Paul is saying. And conversely, if you're not in Christ, if you've not been born again, you will walk according to the flesh. In verse 5 and onwards, Paul fleshes out what these two walks look like. Let's read verses 5 through 9. For those who live according to the flesh set their mind on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the spirit set their minds on the things of the spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. For it does not submit to God's law, indeed it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. 
if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. So these two walks, those who are apart from Christ, they set their mind and, and they live according to the flesh. Their mind is hostile to God. They cannot follow God's law. They cannot please God. They do not belong to God. And this walk will eventually lead to death. And the other type of person, the person who is in Christ, will walk according to the Spirit. They will live and set their mind on the Spirit. And this walk will lead to life and peace because the Holy Spirit dwells within them. The commentary makes note that the Spirit is not a force or a thing. You know, oftentimes we can think of the Holy Spirit in such a way. It's a thing to be felt, a force to be experienced. But that's not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is a person. The Holy Spirit is the third person in the triune God who dwells in you. And that means that he's taking up permanent residency in your life. He doesn't come into your life and then maybe if you're not doing so hot, he decides to pack up and leave and come back when you're doing better. No, the Holy Spirit comes and takes up permanent residency in you. On those days where you're doing well and you're on fire and you're on passion for God, he's there. On those days where you're failing and you're struggling and you're doubting, he's still there. The Holy Spirit dwells within you. And we have to notice that these verses that we just read, they're not an exhortation. They're not a command for you to start walking and setting your mind on the Spirit more and more. And this is how you will change. Paul is simply just describing what your life is going to look like in Christ. He's describing what your life is like with the Holy Spirit dwelling within you. But hear this, friends. The Christian life is not perfect. You're not going to be killing sin all the time and having victory over sin all the time. You may, you will. But soon you're going to notice something else that needs to be worked on. There will be some of us who will struggle with sins and addictions for a very long time. These aren't evidences that you're not in Christ, that you're not in this, or the Spirit is not in you. We will stumble and fall and give into our flesh, just like those who walk according to the flesh. But there is a big difference now. In Christ, with the Spirit dwelling within you, you will have new affections. They will be different from who you were when you were before Christ. And those new affections will be an awareness and a conviction of your sin, knowing that this does not please God. This is not what he wants for my life. There will be new affections, a desire, a desire to follow God's law, and even a delight when you do. A Christian's life is not a perfect walk, but the Christian's life is one who knows their sin, repents and goes and turns to God and desires to seek and follow him. There's a quote, I forgot the the person to attribute it to, but it's not my quote. He says this, God does not love you to the degree that you are like Christ. He loves you to the degree that you are in Christ. He doesn't love you to to the degree that you are holy and you are more like him, but he loves you to the degree that you are in Christ. And if you're trusting in Christ, that's 100%. If you're in him, you are in Christ, and God loves you 100% of the time. So though we stumble, though we have this dissonance in us, this struggle, this pain of, of, of falling and not doing the things that we should do and doing the things we ought not to do, church, keep trusting in Christ. Keep turning to him. Depend on his righteousness, not your own. The grace that saved you from your sins is the same grace that will continue to transform your life and mold you more and more into his image. Hold on to the promises that are given to us here in these verses. And look down with me one last time to the final two verses of today's passage, verses 10 and 11. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells 
in you. Amen. 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 If you're trusting in Christ today and the Spirit is dwelling in you, you have a new status, a new purpose, a new walk, and you've been given a promise that you will have complete victory over sin one day. That same Spirit that raised Christ from the grave, that Spirit dwells in you. And whether our time is up or Jesus comes first, whenever that day comes, that Spirit will resurrect you into a new body. And that is a promise. That is a hope that we can hold on to as we struggle with our sin. If you're struggling with addiction, a sin that you can't cut out, something that is just weighing you down, plaguing your life, remember that it does not get the final say. It does not. Life in the Spirit means at the end of your struggles, at the end of your life, there is victory. You will be resurrected with a body that sins no more. If you're dealing with physical illness, mental illness, anxiety, depression, that does not get the final say in your life. Life in the spirit means that you'll be resurrected one day to a perfect, restored body that has no longer has death or decay. Church, continue to fight the good fight. Continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Put to death to those sins. But before all of that, trust and hold on to the promises given to us in these verses. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Let's pray.